And so I feel like if I have a, a passion for continuing this work where that aligns with uh, Dr. Suzuki's beliefs is that seeing each child as individuals in that moment, right? Rather than sort of expecting them to come to you, us going to them and, and uh, meeting them right where they are. Welcome to String Sessions, the music parent podcast. I'm your host, Joanna Farrar, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today, Zachary Sweet. Zachary is a cellist, teacher, and a registered teacher trainer for the Suzuki Association of the Americas. He is also an instructor of cello at Nazareth College and Binghamton University, and on the faculty at Ithaca Talent Education and Music Together of Ithaca. Zach's approach to teaching and the depth of his commitment to helping children flourish as individuals, to seeing them develop as human beings through music in a healthy way, is something that really comes through in his work as a teacher trainer and in his interview today. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Please take a moment to subscribe, and if you like what we're doing, leave us a good review over on Apple Podcasts. Enjoy the show. So thank you very much for joining us. It is my pleasure to have uh, Zachary Sweet on as our guest. As you've heard, his his career is uh, quite varied and his background as a teacher and a teacher training, trainer is very impressive. Uh, I have personally been able to learn from Zachary, which is a wonderful thing for me to be able to say. And so I was really excited. He was one of the first people I thought of that I wanted to have on this podcast. So I'm so happy you could join us. So thank you. Thank you, Joanna. So um, people have heard a little bit about, you know, what you do, where you do that, but very much in brief, what can you tell us a little bit about your musical background and kind of what your what your journey through music was? Did you come from a musical family? Um, was this something that was predestined, shall we say, from your childhood or something you, you gravitated towards? <laughs> Ah, thank you. Um, I for sure ha- had a musical family. Family. Um, my mother uh, is a fairly well-known uh, opera singer. I say fairly well because it's been a while since she's sung publicly. But um, and uh, we grew up singing at home and singing in church. And um, uh, for the beginning thirteen years of my life, we traveled around uh, following my mom's career. And so. Um, yeah, I grew up in some pretty cool musical spaces and, um, my mother and I have varying opinions, whether I chose the cello or whether she pushed it on me. Uh, but inevitably at some point, you know, cello became a thing. And, and, um, I think mostly my connection to music came, uh, was because of my mother. Um, I had my connection to cello developed much later, uh, but I really, really wanted to be my mother when I was younger, uh, and probably to some extent today still. Um, but I wasn't going to be a dramatic soprano, so cello stuck and, uh, here we are. (laughs) Um, yeah, I, uh, in high school, cello stuck, I would say, and um, and that's when I started really practicing uh, just in time. Uh, and I went to Eastman for undergrad and masters, and and then it's just sort of like unveiled after that. I took a slew of professional auditions after grad school, uh, didn't get any of them, um, and really had to like rethink of what my life was going to be. And I stumbled upon a long-term training program in uh, Manhattan and that began the next 15 years, 16 years of of work and focus and uh, it was a something I could never have planned myself so I'm a pretty big believer in sort of like you know divine destiny. (laughs) Absolutely yeah so what age did you start playing cello? Because like you were saying, you obviously very musical family, you know, you grew up singing. I'm a huge believer in singing as being really important in musical training, no matter what. So the moment I hear that, I'm like, oh, yes, singing. But for the cello itself, when did you start? I began when I was eight. Um, and, you know, this is it's so funny because my brother grew up. Uh, he started at four with the Suzuki method. I started eight in a traditional method and we could not have had separate experiences. Um, My brother was really successful at a very young age. And then 
inevitable and then along the way just kind of quit and fizzled out and i had a kind of a rough start and did not connect to the instrument and there was no engagement of the singing um it was all sight reading and um i did not connect and nor did i do well until i was in high school but i think my musical uh my musical background uh environment really gave me the the um the motivation and um, the, the talent's the wrong word, um, desire, I don't know. Yeah, it just sort of music came out of me almost despite my my level of playing. I think that's, that's a really, that's a, a lovely thing to hear also because I think that sometimes there's, there's such um, emphasis placed on stories of people that like the moment they picked it up it was just meant to be. And then there was probably a halo that came down from the sky uh, and they were instantly able to play like all eight books of Suzuki. And, and that's not necessarily what it takes to become a professional or not necessarily, I mean, it can be great when that happens. It also doesn't necessarily mean anything or not mean anything. So that's... <laughs> I know, I think I'm probably more of the Angela Duckworth cellist, like grit really is what got <laughs> what brought me here uh passion and perseverance yeah. not yeah uh, easy from the beginning <laughs> mm -hmm. no but that's very true because i think that that also can sometimes be be difficult when people have an expectation that if it's not you know coming easily to someone like to you know to your child or to you then does that mean it's not meant to be no no not not in the least i would imagine you would you would argue i would completely agree but <laughs> Um, it's just a finding, yeah. finding what is the, the path to that. So you are obviously uh, an excellent teacher um, and you are within the Suzuki method uh, and you do your teacher training through that. So you are a, a believer in the Suzuki method along with others, I'm sure. Um, are there things that you feel you bring to the Suzuki method and, and how you work with, with young students that is informed by your background and kind of like what your child experience, childhood experiences were with learning? Yeah, actually, it's a really good question. Um, I, I've done a lot of thinking about this. I'm, uh, this is my second year of being a teacher trainer. I became a teacher trainer in 2021 and January. Um, and I've thought a lot about that in the beginning. I, I sort of had a lot of, um, um, yeah, anxiety, I think, about being a teacher trainer because there's, you know, you're sitting with with people who wrote, literally wrote the books that were that were studying and, and, um, and I think what I have come to learn about myself is that my, um, I have an ability to draw in children from the beginning. Um, my, my friends and colleagues joke uh, about me being some kind of Pied Piper, that I have an, a, a, a way to sort of clue in and zone in to, to exact moments on the spot. And I think that's what I missed as a child. I, I really feel uh, in my musical upbringing, no one really saw me for a long time. Um, people expected a lot from me because I am my mother's child. Um, but I, I really felt um, unseen. Um, and so I feel like if I have a, a, a passion for continuing this work where that aligns with uh, Dr. Suzuki's beliefs is that seeing each child as individuals in that moment, right? Rather than sort of expecting them to come to you, us going to them and, and uh, meeting them right where they are. Yeah, I think um, that's a that's a difficult skill, no matter what art form it's in. But because it also takes a lot of attention and a lot of time to be able to um, give that personalized attention, I think that's one of the beautiful things about music lessons. I know that you teach group classes as well as individual private lessons, but it's it's interesting to me because music is one of those areas where kids of different ages can get personal attention from a teacher for a set amount of time, which in schools. It's not necessarily always possible um, with that I idea of, you know, seeing each child, how, how do you manage that in a group setting? I'm just curious because <laughs> that becomes more difficult, right? <laughs> yeah, it does. It, 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 I think it, um, it goes with the, 
the tool you're using. So there are uh, strategies you can use that where you hear hearing each person of the group individually in some sort of relay race or, uh, you know, my turn, your turn, or uh, what my friend uh, friends call soccer or, you know, passing something back and forth and getting a chance, even in a group setting to sort of clue to zone in and 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 grab their their eyes you know uh, or ears or whatever is drawing them in so um yeah it's it's quite possible uh in a group uh in, in a group setting as well and in some cases actually children uh, do better in a group setting because some on occasion the 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 one-on-one -on -one scenario is too much attention or too much pressure or stress uh of producing something you know Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's very, that's very true. Um, so when you you primarily, as you said, you're a teacher trainer for the Suzuki method, um, you use that, I'm assuming in the way that you teach your private lessons and, and group classes and things of that nature. There is a, a heavy emphasis in the Suzuki method on parental involvement. And we've already talked about how your background and having a musical family was a, a big part of um, you know, what you have become as, as, a, as a teacher and as a musician, yeah. how do you feel that, you know, if there are parents who are listening who <laughs> are not professional opera singers, um, <laughs> how, do you, as, <laughs> how do you as a teacher, uh, you know, advise or, or try to help parents become more a part of that, that musical journey for the kids? <laughs> Yeah, that's a really important distinction because what I feel like I didn't admit, what I feel like I actually got from my mother was not her skill and ability, um, but it was the disposition for music. In my family, I grew up with where music was celebrated and it was music was part of the, the you know, the weaving of our family unit. Uh, my brother, all of, everyone played music. My sister, my brother, my dad was a musician. So, that participation in music uh, was was really critical um, for my family, and I, you know, it's the participation of music. I feel so often, especially in the United States, there's sort of a consumer-based uh, version of music where you're listening, you're purchasing music, you're going to a concert, but the actual participation where you're creating music and you're playing with music and you're changing music that's really what i think i received from my my background and you don't need to be a professional musician to do that and this is what i tell my families all the time you know i often have uh parents who claim to be tone deafness even tone deaf even though that is actually a really much lower percentage uh, of people than than we expect um more often is the case that they have there are just muscles that haven't been developed and their their ear isn't connected to their larynx or you know there's something more at at, at play um so uh, creating a space of music um, is just a, an active choice and um, that anyone can do that. Um, so yeah, I, I uh, hang in there. If you're a parent <laughs> who, who doesn't feel musically adequate, um, just know that you are, what you are modeling is something that is important for your child. And I think that goes for anything. If you think that um, table manners are, are important for your child, you model that in, in what you want. If music is important for your child, you have to make space for that in your family daily, right? Just like a language. Yeah, yeah, because that that is very much a part of the Suzuki ethos of you know imitation, but but very positive imitation and being aware of what is being modeled around kids because kids are obviously learning all the time, <laughs> as hopefully we adults are too. Although maybe we don't do it as well as kids, but. <laughs> You know, there's this instinctive thing, um, I think, that parents uh, do with a newborn. As newborns begin developing or phonating or playing with what can easily be tossed aside as babble really is, is, is music, right? They're imitating speech pattern and, uh, and we're talking infants, you know, weeks, barely months old. Uh, and there's a sensitivity and there's a grace that parents give babies because babies are literally helpless. <laughs>
but then our expectations change as as they develop into toddlers and their as their bodies grow our ex i have found that the expectations become more severe that somehow they should be able to do something better whereas i think if we held on to that that same approach of playfulness and environment and uh, entrusting the process of like creating a, an environment where they can learn something rather than teaching at them and i can't i can't pinpoint it but there's this shift in parents and i think maybe i, I fall into this category too uh so i'm i'm always thinking about it um where our education strategy changes where we're not we're less creating an environment for crawling or or for eating with a utensil or for potty training and now it's more sit here and learn this thing and regurgitate it back to me and i'm always th trying to sort of recreate spaces where uh, either in the lesson or the group class or you know in one-on-one -on -one meetings with parents where we can sort of hold on to that in that environment and that rapport that serve and volley as my my friend lily levinowitz talks about uh, rather than a uh, sort of a lecture based um, uh, process absolutely i think that 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 sense of play and that sense of um allowing as opposed to sort of trying to enforce is a difficult line um and i i know that it's something that i'm sure every teacher is familiar with the question which comes up where parents will ask and how much should my child practice in the lesson and then there is this expectation that <laughs> that the teacher will just declare the amount and then all is settled <laughs> but i was wondering what your question about this obviously it's the eternal question but <laughs> oh man yeah really putting me on the spot because it's gonna be in <laughs> Sorry. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna fess up to it i don't know yeah. i mean i think um because i am not that kind of a teacher i am not the kind of a teacher that uh, that says that a one recipe is going to create the same results in each student it is totally dependent on that person and that student and it depends on what you want from the process. It depends on so much. So, you know, like I, I have avoided, I have avoided uh, recipe giving um, like the plague in my, in the, probably the past four or five years, I was very recipe driven. And I found that I really missed a lot of character development in my students. They got really good at the instrument. Um, and so I really, I, I sort of had this shift of like, let's go away from the recipe and let's look towards, is what you're doing working for what you want, right? So are you auditioning for this thing? Are you playing this? Or do you expect to be able to play this piece by next week? How did it go for you? Was what you did enough? If the answer is yes, keep doing that. If the answer is no, let's let's plan accordingly let's strategize another uh routine or you're adding something new to the to the fold you're like trying to instill in in your students that this doesn't replace anything you, your time has to expand i don't know how much that time is how good do you want your vibrato to be how how thorough do you want to be a sight reader how quickly do you want to become a sight reader maybe visual learning is your thing and maybe that's when the time sort of maybe that's when you your um learning really takes off and maybe that's what that ingredient is for for longer practices um so uh, yeah i'm i'm much more of a what do you want and is what you're doing working for what you want um which is hard which is easy for older students. So let me f rephrase this for younger students then. For younger students, my suggestion is you practice for the time of how long your lesson is. Because I'm not expecting to have this conversation with a four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, and so I think that that it's, it basically comes down to knowing 
that goes back to what you were saying actually about the the being able to see actually really see and hear each student because that means that you are participating in what the students goals are and then reflecting back to them how those things are either happening or not happening with how they're practicing or how much they're practicing as opposed to the start the clock you play until the bell rings type of thing which i understand because sometimes I, I feel like it's it's difficult for parents because they they just want to have markers and you know you can understand like the the desire to have markers that you can check off a list because that that makes it more manageable but in the long term the the goal based or at least the experience base is much more productive as opposed to the setting the timer <laughs> and there are and i'm sure there are, I, i'm you know i'm constantly looking i'm i'm thinking about one family in particular um right now where i feel like you know, I, maybe I do need to be a little bit more like you're doing this, 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 this every day. I'm sure there are, and the, but this goes with any teacher student relationship that for that, the way that I teach, the way uh, won't fit everyone's, everyone's personalities or needs. So it's this, uh, it's this give and take always of, uh, and actually less of a give and take and more of a reflection. Is this working? Are you getting, are you making the progress you, you want to make? Um, I really started thinking um, about this more during COVID because um, during COVID online lessons became so much more than just learning new pieces. It was sort of our, our connection to other people. It was, it was clear that these weekly meetings, as frustrating even as group classes online were, it was clear that these weekly happenings were, were, were quite uh, meaningful and, um, and dare I say even a lifeline for, for some families, just to have that connection in a time where we didn't have that connection, you know. Um, and it really got me thinking about like, okay, so like what is... So what are we really doing here if this is filling, fulfilling a need that I, I guess we'd all, we always think we're, we're, we're fulfilling, which is something a little bit more deep, um, something, you know, a permanent place in their life, an appreciation for music and appreciation for the processes of music and the people in music, the teachers, et cetera. Um, but, you know, there were lessons where we just didn't play and we just sort of like, talked about anxieties and like, you know, we had a space where there was a, a trust in a, in a sort of a safe space where people could just like be there and be like, I didn't practice this week because I'm, I couldn't get out of bed or, you know, I don't know. But, um, so yeah, it, it really, um, sort of shifted some, some thinking that I, that I, that I had previously held. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, that also goes back to that music lessons being something a little bit different from other things in in kids and adults' lives. Because I think uh, I have um, I have friends who have adult students. I myself have a few adult students, and, and it can be it's very meaningful for people of all ages. And especially when we were going through COVID, that was very difficult and challenged each person in a different way, which allowed music to help us in in those unexpected ways as well as the expected ways. <laughs> um, so when you are working with a new student, I find it always interesting. Um, my friends and my colleagues and I will sometimes have this conversation about what are some of the things that you know as a teacher are, I don't wanna necessarily say misconceptions, although it could be misconceptions that you're going to need to address right away or things that are something that you're probably going to address pretty early on that you see very frequently? Good question. Um, I think, oh man. <laughs> yeah, so one of my friends, uh, uh, their their thing is addressing vibrato because they, they frequently just hone in on the issues in someone's vibrato that has come from before or preconceived notions about vibrato and, and stuff like that. Or it can be just preconceived notions about what lessons are about or for or something like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've got my answer now. Thank you for giving me a little space. <laughs> um, 
So my, I think the misconceived notion is, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about this sort of like sit and tell sort of situation that like you mention it once and you'll never have to mention it again. I think one of the big, one of the earliest lessons I have to teach parents is that these are conversations, these are topics we are going to have to develop for the next 10, 15 years, right? So we have, or part of the beauty of being a Suzuki teacher that this is what, you know, you know, Dr. Suzuki was so good at, um, was isolating and breaking down a skill to its beginning seed. And so, you know, you, you lay that seed and then every year, every month, whatever your cycle is, you give that a little water and you just watch it grow over time, right? So if you're t- talking about tone, having, adjusting the bow hold or talking about, you know, posture, I mean, you're, you're, we're really refining things for a long, long, long time. And in fact, I, I don't want sort of a what most would describe as a perfect posture in the beginning, because I associate so much like stillness with stiffness. And so what I, what I really want to encourage with the parents is that we want a lot of like flexibility and looseness and finding the right position for the certain thing. Of course, at some t- there comes a time where you need to have this exact position for this exact sounds, but we are so not there for a long time, right? So it having a realistic expectation for what is possible for that age, development stage, learning style, um, and, and diffusing um, this sort of polish um, that I think Suzuki has a uh, a reputation for like excellence at a really early age, and certainly that is true. I want to make space for that, while at the same time making space for it's okay that it's not perfect now. Let's keep an eye on it, and we'll come back to it, you know, and we'll keep track of it over the next month or so. It's different every, you know, so the same path is just different for every, every single child. Yes, which I think then also plays into something that because I got to take some of the teacher training, just the basics with you. And I, I do remember this from my own time as a Suzuki student, because I was a, I was a Suzuki kid very proudly and very happily. Um, and, and that is that lessons involve an enormous amount of review, that there is an emphasis on, um, well, I want to hear it in your words, obviously, but for myself, like this idea of refining things that you already know and then adding to it another layer without, because that I think that plays into the idea of what you were saying about like you have not achieved perfection and then you move on and you never touch it again because it was perfect. It sits in a case and it's done. We move yes. on. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that is the review is, is Dr. One of Dr. Suzuki's um, cornerstones. I mean, that's one of the things that he really built um, his philosophy on. And it is so true. And I think the, the, uh, the reference I, I often make in, uh, in courses is, I mean, the first time you learned, let's say for cello, the first time I learned Dvorak cello concerto, I sounded horrible. But by the third, the fourth, the fifth time of playing it and eventually performing it with an orchestra, it got manageable. It sounded better. So that I, I, I think I, I put a lot of um, emphasis on review of my own students because that's where I've seen the most growth. And that was a really big, sh- that was something I had to just trust in. That was a trust the process moment because as an early teacher, I think I much more favored the note feeding and the next piece, um, like previewing. And so the proportions of my lesson were, were, were probably pretty askew. And I, I I just was unhappy with the results and um, shifted at some point. And I could, I don't really have a good 
I have a pin, I don't really have a pinpoint of when I did that, but I just started reviewing more and just and started enjoying um, the lessons more because when when you're using review, children are less frustrated. They've, it's something that they've, the, that they may groan to play Twinkle again or French folk song or Happy Farmer or whatever you're playing. But the, the mental fatigue isn't there because it's a new concept and they just need time to do it, right? So it's not this uphill battle. So yeah, there's a thousand different ways of playing Twinkle that where you can mask a new technique or a new skill or, you know, play perpetual motion 80 different ways with different bowings that doesn't seem so new, but pr promotes so much flexibility or, you know, so there's, yeah, review is a, um, is a, is a big one. It's probably my favorite tool in the, in the lesson. And I think that that though plays into the idea that, um, let's say if you're a parent, you, you may be tempted to think like, well, I want to just see constant progress and as many new pieces as possible being learned, because doesn't that mean things are going better? But you have to kind of like understand that within that method and, and other methods besides Suzuki, you know, training as well, but certainly, as you said, very emphasized in Suzuki training, the, the idea that things will continue to layer. And it's not just like a straight shot from book one to Paganini and you don't touch anything really in between. Um, but yeah, I think that that's that's an interesting point, and it ties into the the need for patience in the layering process, which can be tough, and also tough for students too. I mean, we all sometimes like to just think that we can move on in a straight shot, as opposed to needing to circle back. Yeah. Um, well, and think of like you know, since you we were talking about like you know how difficult it is for parents um, sometimes to create an environment at home, and you know, especially when they feel not un you know, non-musical themselves. Um, I mean, that's a layup. You're not sure what to do or you're having a particularly frustrating day. Review your songs and leave on, end on a, on a positive note. You know, if that one new teaching point, if that vibrato is frustrating, leave it, it'll get there. Trust the process, review your songs with, you know, you know, uh, uh, with a, a point in mind, maybe your teachers was like, oh, you have to be on the tips of your fingers in order for vibrato to happen. Cool, we can do that. Review all your songs where all you're thinking about where is the tip of your finger, right? So, you know, that's a, that is like my, that's, that is my, my go-to like diffuser almost. That's frustrating. Okay, let's go back a couple steps. <laughs> let's play something that isn't so frustrating. As opposed to just trying to power through it in a way that may not be helpful. Yeah. It never works. <laughs> no, it doesn't work for any of us, although sometimes. <laughs> um, so there's this idea, which we mentioned earlier, of the Suzuki Triangle, which is like, you know, teacher, child, and parent. And there is also a point when, you know, as kids are older, then there needs to be, there is that social component that comes in more. Do you encourage your students to be in youth orchestras? Like, how do you find that the social component is something like beneficial uh, for kids that you teach? Are there, are there like activities like summer camps that you think they should do or chamber music groups or what's your opinion on how to positively impact that? Well, my, so let's start with my knowledge of, of teenage years, especially is that if you have a teenager that has friends that are musical, there's a really good chance that your teenager will stay motivated and stay participatory in music. Um, it's really challenging because peers are such a heavy influence uh, beginning in, in middle school, uh, teenage years. Um, in some case, I mean, I would argue to say they have an equal weight of influence on our on our children as parents do because that social engagement is just so critical um and so i think a lot of that a lot of that ties into note reading a lot of that ties into group classes and i think that's all headed towards that direction because our favorite experiences as musicians are making music with people right not i, I i've seldom met somebody who says, I love playing solo music and never with anybody else. And those are my highlights, you know, um, 
so uh, the group class is a sort of a natural feeder for that where where you are have created a space where you're you have a social network and you're working on reading skills you're working on working as an ensemble and then uh, I happen to be pretty fortunate in, in the, the school that I work for in, in Ithaca, Ithaca Talent Education, has a starting, starting orchestra program. And so even as a, as a fledgling reader, you can be in a beginning orchestra program. And then Ithaca also happens to have an, a, 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 a really successful youth orchestra, Cuyuga Chamber Orchestra Youth Orchestra. And... Um, you know, so people seem to sort of like go through those channels and um, and it's pretty rich. So there's a motivation to do that. I, um, I think of, of, of places that don't seem to have those and it becomes challenging. And then <clears throat> maybe the teacher, maybe I would have to work a little bit harder in saying, okay, let's make cello choir your ensemble and let's make that your chamber music and let's work, let's meet once a week and then have concerts and I, I might have to put more effort into <clears throat> into creating those spaces um but for sure um those as as a teenager i really want them to have outlets where they can have as much influence as say sports or drama or something like that where there's such a heavy influence of 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 uh, peer participation mm -hmm. i think that that kind of that ties beautifully into a question that I had. There's two questions, actually, um, both around motivation. I'll address the second one first, I think, which uh, is that we've ju you just mentioned the idea of playing in groups. And, you know, it's wonderful that you have that tie into youth orchestra programs. Myself, New Jersey Symphony has a youth orchestra program. I think all of those, there's so many. And the, the teachers and the, you know, the organizations doing that work to create those spaces for kids. I am just so thankful that they exist and it's, yeah, we all need to support them, please. They, they need to continue and, and grow. Um, besides that, like, are there ways that you think about motivating kids that you are teaching? As we were saying, I mean, maybe this is a hard one because every kid is, is different, but are there things that you particularly see that, that help motivate kids to continue or to get excited about music in general? Yeah. Um, there's a couple things that come to mind. The first is that I will often pair young kids together as practice partners. So if I think I have an older student um, who would be a great mentor for a younger student who may have a harder time practicing or have a busier life or just seem to, to not be, be um, uh, cluing in right away, I think pairing kids up for that motivate for that, you know, one-on-one -on -one, um, social time, practice time with friends is, is, is a pretty beautiful thing. And it's been very successful when I've done it. I'm not regimented about doing it with every student, but uh, it's something that I've used before uh, as an sort of an inter level exchange of information and and um, silliness and you know and then uh the other thing that and it's only on my mind because we we're, we're about to participate in it but uh every year we do something called shell olympics um and this was started by uh one of my best friends andrea yin and it's sort of like you know sort of gone to several parts of the country and i know that people do it in utah and we're doing it out here in, in new york and she's in michigan and um cello olympics is is exactly what it sounds it's a it's an event where we celebrate um cello effort and people get medals like you would at the olympics and you can register for different events as you would in the olympics and um and it and it's a it's a really a big party about celebrating um so creating those like motivations that anyone from beginning to advance can participate in and together i think <laughs> Uh, is 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 really um, is neat um, and it's there's a lot of excitement around it and you know so it's yeah it's um, things like that where 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 the focus can be about the participation rather than always about the you know maybe about 
I'm going about I'm going to say it anyway, but rather than always being about the music and being it, just about being participatory in the process of learning and the process of of music um, because you know to be in a youth orchestra you have to audition and you have to there are a lot of hoops you've got to get through and this is like come one come all yeah um, <clears throat> and what the, the second question which is related to that is uh, I I'm sure you have many things that that would answer this question but what do you feel uh, motivates you the most as a teacher I mean, what is it that that you most particularly love about what you do because I mean, anyone listening to this interview, I'm sure, can tell that you do love what you do. So what is that that you would put your finger on if you had to? <laughs> yeah, I think I can. I'm a pretty silly person. And so I really, I think what gets me up and working with children every day is is that playfulness. That um, it's it brings such joy to to work with, with children. Um, and it's it's something that I would do for free if that were viable <laughs> in today's society. Um, and yeah, I think that 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 children sort of have this this the key to 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 peace. And you know, they just being in in front of children, it it is it's an honor and fun. I mean, they're super fun. I feel like. As adults, we get really boring after a while. Like we just go to work and we, you know, whatever. Kids are, they will make a game out of anything. And, and the excitement, the, um, the, the novelty of things. I think we can learn a lot from, from being in the presence of children. I remember me in my, the first time I was in front of a child or the thought of being in front of a four-year-old petrified me. And I was right, rightfully petrified because being in front of a child is sort of like a mirror, right? It sort of reflects back any insecurity you might have, any um, frustration that you might have about yourself or, you know, and that's, it's why it's so easy to sort of like, you know, deliberately decide for children what they do, to put hand, like to, to manipulate what they're doing um, rather than just sitting in their presence and sort of like negotiating that space and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I think that I get to be, I get to be a better version of myself when I'm, when I'm around, when I'm around children, there's a, there's a, there's a respect, uh, there. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is absolutely beautiful. And I know exactly what you mean. I remember the first time I taught a four-year-old, even though I had started as a four-year-old, I was like, oh, this is terrifying. This is oddly terrifying. <laughs> and then it was great and wonderful, but it is very different um, because that that there is an an honesty and a challenge to that, which is really beautiful. Um, and I think that's a, a wonderful point to keep in mind. Um, and they have a way of like pushing your buttons without knowing it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Do and you? It's like our, and it's like our job to be like, oh wait, that's on me. That's not you. You didn't know you're. <laughs> I genuinely don't know the answer to this, and I'm curious, do you teach any adult students? I do here, I do and did here and there. I would say um, I teach college age students. Um, I think it's arguable whether we, how adult we decide they are <laughs> or whether we think they are. The, the, prefrontal, <laughs> the prefrontal cortex doesn't really fully develop until you're in your late 20s. So. Um, there's a lot of decision making, a lot of like uh, stuff that continues to grow until you know uh, your late twenties. So anyway, um, but I've certainly uh, taught um, older adults, and it's it's joyful, um, and uh, it's it's um, it's different in in that there's a I found that the the adult students that I've had are choosing it for the journey rather than the the ability per se and i say that with respect because of course adults can still develop a uh, a pretty fine level of playing and i don't necessarily i don't expect anything less of them because they're 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 older but i i appreciate the um i appreciate the the search and the um the I'm looking for a hobby kind of uh, an approach 
because I think there's nothing cooler than I think the cello is awesome. Um, and if you're in a in a community that has a community orchestra, even better than they have an actual, they actually have a chance of of still of you know participating in music with other people as well, and um, and that can be a pretty fun partnership. Yeah, yeah, and that sense of play can certainly you know occur at all ages. We we get to do it as professional musicians, and and everyone I think should have more of that opportunity in their lives, whether it's through music or some other art. I think. Yeah. yeah, we make this really serious, don't we? <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it an adult thing or is it a musician thing? Is it a both thing? I don't know. There is this sort of like, you know, I found that the, um, the, ol the older I've gotten, the less, um, not the less serious, but I do mean less serious. Like it doesn't, like we're it has to be fun. I mean, the only reason to become a musician is because you're having fun. If you're like, I mean, it's not, you're not doing it for the money. You're not doing it for the fame because you probably won't have any. You're not doing it for the retirement because you won't have any unless you're lucky. It has to be fun. It has to be like this. It has to be a, like a vocation. But at some point, because I still have a really, really active performing career, I notice that that it becomes so heady almost that that the the joy and the flexibility go away somehow with the in the pursuit of high level of art mate of art. You know, and I don't. I, I, don't, I can't put my finger on why I think that is because I don't think they're mutually exclusive, right? You, we play better when we're playful. And I think that that playfulness um, just, it's, I know exactly what you mean because this is one of those things where I'm sure it's just really difficult to try to put words on this. Um, but there is something challenging also in like having fun at a very high level can be very, very difficult at the same time, which is not to say, oh, well, you just do things that are easy or at a certain point it becomes easy and that's how you're having fun. It can still be very much a challenge, very much a full body and like mind and spirit experience, which has challenge to it. And it is also joy at the same time. So I think that's also the problem with the defini definitions of these words. They're a little imprecise. So <laughs> at least for our culture and our language, maybe, maybe we don't do it as well as we could. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's very, that's very awesome. Um, well, I have very much appreciated your time and being able to talk to you. I am sure that we will have many other things to talk about on another occasion. I would love to uh, have you just tell us a little bit about where to find you and, you know, what projects you have coming up. And, and you know, obviously I will link to all these things in the show notes. So if you're listening, um, you will be able to click on things about that. But can you tell us what you've got going on? Yeah. Well, you can find me uh, on social media. I'm, I'm really present uh, at Z Sweet Cello. That's Z-S-W-E-E-T-C-L-L-O um, on Instagram. Um, and then, um, you know, Facebook, I'm easy to find as well. Um, I just yesterday finished a uh, recording for Society for New Music in Syracuse. So there's an album coming out in the fall of, of all new music and it's uh, really, really exciting stuff. So you can uh, look for Society for New Music uh, in Syracuse. And, um, you know, we're, I'm getting ready for um, a long uh, summer of institute teaching and I'm really looking forward to it. I'll be at um, Intermountain Suzuki Strings Institute in Utah. I'll be at Ithaca Suzuki Institute uh, in Ithaca. I'll be at the Advanced uh, Suzuki Institute uh, out in California and then Green Mountain out, out by you actually in Vermont. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be an exciting summer um, and yeah, catch me where you can. That is wonderful. I, I am very happy to have gotten to talk to you again today and i hope that we'll have another opportunity to have you back on the show so that people can hear more from you so thank you so much for your time and thank you for what you do for students and teachers out there i appreciate it thank you joanna zach is a fantastic teacher teacher trainer and a lovely human being to speak with and i appreciated his time for this interview 
I couldn't agree more with him that children's development, even in a system as beautifully rigorous and thought out as the Suzuki method, which I began on, is still not a cookie cutter experience. And teachers and parents can bring a spirit of play and exploration and patience to every practice and lesson experience. It leads to far better and quicker growth in the long term, as I've seen in my own private studio as well. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please take a moment to share it with a friend or leave us a good review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. And you can always reach out to chat with me via Instagram. I'm at Joanna Ferrar 802 and I love to chat with people about the show and music in general. You can also, of course, find more about us on our website at www.musicparentpodcast.com or on my personal website, joannaferrar.com. Thanks for joining us, and I will see you next time.